All right, guys, we are at 103. We're going to go ahead and get started today. Thanks for coming. This webinar is uh, presented by the IT consulting company and Microsoft Gold Partner Mirazon, along with Tandem Solution, a Microsoft partner for learning solutions. Tandem Solution specializes in providing both in-person and virtual training for IT professionals, network database and developers, project managers, and end users. So again, thank you for coming today. And we're going to go on to the next slide and let you know a little bit about myself so you have a face to put with the voice. My name is Andy Cook. I am a systems engineer for Mirazon. I've been with the company for almost five years. Uh, my certifications and all the fun stuff and letters after my name are listed below. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at AndyCook502. It's about the only thing that I use social media wise. So thanks again for being here and we are going to do a quick poll question before we get started. On a scale of one to five, how familiar are you with Windows 10? All right, well, thank you guys for taking a quick minute to answer that question. It gives me a good indicator of kind of what you guys are looking at and what you all have been doing as far as your interest and involvement level with Windows 10. I myself have been using Windows 10 for almost, almost a year now. I did a presentation on one of the much, much earlier builds back around uh, Christmas time, and it was, a, it was a great success. It was myself and a Microsoft partner got together and talked with about 150 people or so about it. Uh, we had a great, great opportunity to just share some information, and a lot of things have changed since then. Uh, Windows 10 has been very, very evolutionary just in the way that it's been built, the way it's been designed, the way it's been adapted. Um, the preview build's been out for over almost a year now, and during that time, the developers at Microsoft have been getting feedback from the people using the preview build and in that they were able to make changes to things that people wanted to see, make changes to things that people wanted to have done differently or better and what you're seeing now the most current build that's out for use is 10130 that is the most current one that is going it is also the uh, one that's going to be there's going to be a few changes between now and release date on July 29th, but this is going to be much closer to what you're going to see in the long term. The purpose of today, um, the purpose of today is there's a bunch of different places where you can go and read about Windows 10 online. There's a bunch of places with different people writing articles telling you this, that, and the other about different parts. We're trying to get a good, concise resource for you that gives you a good overview, but also gives you some um, more user-friendly and also base-level things that you as an end user and as an administrator will want to know in regards to using the operating system going forward. So the next poll question is going to be coming up, which is what version of Windows are you currently on? I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to answer that question. Again, thank you guys so much for answering that question. Um, one of the things, too, that's a goal is not only to consolidate all this stuff into one place so you guys have a good idea of, of what's coming down, it's also a good opportunity for you, able, you to be able to share with others what you learn from this webinar, what you learn from the other links to different information that we have within this presentation so that you can share that with others. 
Um, one of the things that I'm pretty passionate about as an IT administrator and engineer is I want to get I want to get all the information out there as much as I possibly can. I don't want us to be a group of people that holds information close to the chest and keeps our secrets close so that we have something special that no one else has. And um, it's also an opportunity for you to be familiar with it so that you can kind of encourage those end users that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis of what it's going to look like to use this operating system going forward. It's also going to help to reduce the number of calls that you get into your help desks and your triage of when you transition if you educate the end users going forward. So again, uh, there will be a couple of hyperlinks to different websites that I've used and places that I've done some research that will be given at the end of the presentation as well. And the slide deck will be available as well. Um, if uh, you know somebody who couldn't make it, the slide deck will be available for you to share out with them as well. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the idea of the platform convergence. Um, what we're talking about here, this was a slide that was uh, borrowed from a gentleman at Microsoft that I did the presentation with back in December. If you notice here, all the different Windows platforms on the left, you have the Xbox 360, Xbox One, Windows 7, 5, Windows 8, all of those things, and you see all these lines slowly coming together. What we're getting at is that every single device that is running a Microsoft product or a version of Windows is going to have a version of Windows 10 on it. So there will be an update to Xbox One that will push out a Windows 10 version for Xbox One. Windows 8.1 will upgrade and convert to Windows 10. And if you're on one of the versions of Windows 8, 8.1, or Windows 7, you can actually upgrade straight to Windows 10. The, uh, the Xbox 360 will not go to Windows 10. The Xbox 360 is going to be a, it's going to get its last round of updates, and it will probably still get security updates and patches from Microsoft. I'm not 100% sure about that, but as far as going to the Windows 10 operating system, it will not. It is Xbox One and forward. So with that said, um, this also applies to Windows Phone. So if you're on Windows Phone 8.1, that will also upgrade to the Windows 10 mobile client. Just to give you kind of an idea of all these things, it's all the same basic OS on the back end, but I will go through right now and uh, explain a little bit of versions and licensing now before we move on. And um, you guys are getting a little ahead of me with the questions. That all is coming down the slides. So versions and licensing. Uh, the additions of Windows 10 were announced on May 13th. Uh, numerous versions are coming. All of them are the same basic OS, like I said, on the back end. Uh, the versions are dependent on the device, where, and how it will be used. If you're running Windows Service Pack 1 on Windows 7, it will be a straight upgrade to Windows 10. You will not have to go Windows 8 and then go to 10. Windows 7 Service Pack 1 will upgrade automatically to Windows 10. Now, the next part that we're going to cover in a moment is going to be with volume licensing. But for my next poll question, within your organization, how many of you all have software assurance right now with your volume licensing agreements? And there's a poll question coming out for that. Thanks again, guys, for answering those questions. Um, some of you don't know, so you say yes, those that do have software assurance, yes, that's going to be a huge benefit to you on a number of uh, different levels. For those of you that don't know, um, if you're an enterprise uh, level customer or even some small and medium sized businesses that use volume licensing, um, what software assurance is going to allow you is going to be shown in the next slide as far as versions and licensing go. And if you have questions that come up on that, feel free to ask them. Um, I may take a few minutes and look over questions at the end too and answer the ones that I feel I, one that I can answer or two that I have a good place to point you.
All right, versions and licensing. Um, the different versions just looks a little bit like it used to in Windows 7 for all of you that are familiar with that. You have home, mobile, pro, enterprise, you have education, and you have mobile enterprise. So Windows 10 Home is the home use version. If you're running just a home office or a work group at your house, um, most of you are going to have that particular version. So if you're on, say, Windows 8.1, the non-pro version, that's the equivalent to uh, Windows Home. Windows 10 Pro is the equivalent to Windows 8.1 Pro or Windows 7 Pro, Service Pack 1. Windows 10 Mobile is the mobile version of Windows 10 for um, your tablets and phones and things of that nature. Um, Windows 10 Enterprise is for business with a volume licensing agreement and software assurance. So um, what that means is as far as pricing and all that stuff goes, um, what you're going to realize is that if you're on Windows 10 Home, you automatically get a free upgrade. If you're on Windows 8.1 Mobile, you get a free upgrade to Windows 10 Mobile when that update comes out through your um, mobile use provider or if you're running a bunch of tablets within your office that are running Windows 8.1 Mobile, that would be what that would be for. Windows 10 Pro, and this has been kind of a, a question mark that there's still a little bit of ambiguity around this, but from everything that I've heard and everything that I understand is that anybody running the Windows 8.1 Pro or Windows 7 Pro version of Windows is going to get the free upgrade to Windows 10 the only people that are not going to get that free upgrade per se is anybody that's an enterprise volume license customer who does not have software assurance. If you have a volume license agreement with software assurance, then you're entitled to those upgrades as well as part of the software assurance agreement. If you don't have software assurance with your volume licensing agreement, I encourage you to look into that in the future. It's not going to do you a whole lot of good right now but uh, it's definitely something to look into, but that's the way that the Windows 10 upgrades are going to work for volume licensing. I've also read some articles that say not only that, but also that um, the having the software assurance on the volume license agreement is going to allow you to slow down how quickly you upgrade your environment as well. The From July 29th, for a year, you have the ability to upgrade to Windows 10 for free on the home or the pro or the mobile version. Windows 10 education has to do with academic volume licensing, which is a whole nother ball of wax altogether. But they are still going to be with those educational and academic volume licenses, have the ability to do upgrades as well. Uh, mobile 10, uh, Windows 10 Enterprise Mobile is mobile clients, phones, and tablets. Same thing, volume licensing with software assurance for those upgrades as well. But the um, question came in about the 32-bit version as opposed to the 64-bit version. There is a 32-bit version of Windows 10, and you can upgrade to that. Um, the one thing to keep in mind, though, is that 32-bit architecture is getting closer and closer to legacy, so there's going to be lots and lots of things that are only going to provide 64-bit drivers and stuff like that, and we're really starting to get to that point where we're passing that threshold. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. But yes, um, I actually just was rebuilding a, a laptop earlier today, and if you go and look the preview versions, there is a 64 and a 32-bit version. So it doesn't matter which one, it's just the Windows 7 Service Pack 1. If you're not on Service Pack 1, you need to do that first. I recommend doing that if you haven't, because um, I still sometimes find computers that don't have Service Pack 1 installed. Do that, and then as you, as you go forward and get Windows updates, one thing you'll notice is in the bottom right-hand corner, close to where the clock is, you'll see a, uh, a little window that pops up that allows you to go ahead and reserve your Windows 10 upgrade right now, as opposed to waiting until July 29th and then going and trying to get it when everybody else is. If you go ahead and set up that reservation, you'll be able to get it, and you'll be kind of first in line, per se, to get that. And you'll notice that as you push down Windows updates, that that little uh, window that looks like the start menu on Windows 8.1 is going to appear on the right-hand bottom of your uh, desktop. 
So keep an eye out for that if you haven't seen it yet. It is something that will be coming um, as you apply Windows updates and you'll see that. So you can go ahead and take advantage of that if you would like. Uh, Windows RT, uh, I was looking earlier, they are not going to provide a direct upgrade for Windows RT like the Surface RTs. There's going to be some new features they said are going to be added, but it was not covered under the Windows 10 uh, free upgrade. And who knows, they may change their song on that, but the last thing that I read was there was not going to be a direct upgrade to Windows 10 for um, the Surface RT. Um, I have a question that says, will run along with the existing Windows version or only 10? Um, and if you could kind of figure out a different way to word that, because I'm not really sure what you're asking, but I'd love to answer your question if I can. I'm not 100% sure what you're asking there, but I'd love to answer it. Um, we're going to move on to the next slide. This is big news. This came out um, just the other day. Uh, it was announced on the 19th. The article that's in this hyperlink is was written the next day. Uh, if you download a version of the preview build with a Microsoft account, so whatever you use to sign into Microsoft, if you go and install um, the at least the build that I was talking about, which is 10130, and you install it with a Microsoft account, your preview build will be treated as a license that you can upgrade to the full version. I don't know how many of you guys have worked with uh, Windows Beta in the past, 8.1, 8, anytime you were on a beta, when you wanted to get the full version when it was either released to manufacturer or the OEM versions got pushed out or whatever, you had to do a clean build. You couldn't upgrade directly to the full version of a software from a preview build. So that is a huge, huge win for us as the IT community, especially those that are early adopters. This is, this is an awesome opportunity to get the full version without having to go out and completely re rebuild your laptop or desktop from scratch. So the link below will take you directly to the article from what was announced. And um, that, that was a pretty recent addition to my presentation because that news just came out the other day and I was pretty excited when I heard that myself. Can you run two versions of Windows after the upgrade? Um, you can you can have a dual boot environment, yes, but you can't uh, switch back and forth between the OSs like in tandem. You would actually have to log on and boot into the other, but you can still run dual, dual boot environments, but no, you can't run them both at the same time. Um, um, as far as how compatible will applications be with uh, Windows 8.1 to Windows 10, I'm um, not only do I do stuff like this with a lot of desktop work, I'm one of the main uh, wireless engineers for our company as well. So I deal a lot with designing wireless network and infrastructure solutions for clients. And one of the things that I use is a very buggy and particular program that I do my um, analysis and design for wireless networks in. And it's real quirky and it's, uh, it's actually, I can honestly say, running better on Windows 10 than it did on Windows 8.1. I've had no application give me an issue between 8.1 and 10 or 8 and 10 on any of the applications I run on a regular basis. I'm running Office 2013. Um, I'm running the software that I use for my wireless analysis. I'm using a DWG viewer, a PDF converter that was made for a Windows Vista machine. So I'm using software that kind of covers the line and I've not had any of them give me any fits as far as saying that they won't work or having to run them in compatibility mode or anything like that. I've been really, really lucky that there's not been a program that I've used that's given me an issue. I've also seen um, some baseline uses of like Sage 50 and QuickBooks and things like that, and they run in a Windows 10 environment too without any problems. The, uh, the next thing we're going to move on to, just from a standpoint of what are the things that IT administrators care about and need to be made aware of. Um, that's what we're going to kind of cover in this next section. And we have this here, which is the three things that I think are the biggest things that IT admins are going to care about, which is workstation stewardship, and I'm going to go into detail and explain what that is, consistency, and then also Windows Update for business. 
What I mean by workstation stewardship is the Windows desktop is really the lifeblood and the beating heart of most workforces anymore. It's something people depend on. Uh, the change to Windows 10 will be the last OS that people will have to be completely familiar with from basically having to start fresh and then move forward with it. Because one of the things that Microsoft has said is that Windows 10 is going to be the last operating system that it's going to do as a product you can go out into the store and buy. Um, everything else as far as any other changes to Windows 10 coming down the line are going to be done completely via Windows Update there, uh, and service packs and things of that nature. And there's going to be a little bit of an evolution of the way that we've seen Microsoft work. They're shifting um, the way that they're kind of doing things. And one of the ways to do that is they're saying, okay, it's Windows 10. It's the last one we're doing. And um, here it is. And one of the things that you'll notice is that we're going from 8.1 to 10. And the funny story is everybody's like, well, what happened to 9? And then there's the horrible joke that is, well, we'll 7, 8, 9. And it's, it's absolutely terrible, and it's one of the worst jokes ever, but it's still moderately funny. But the thing that we found out is that the reason they went all the way to Windows 10 was because when they were writing the code and started from the ground up and were going to do it as Windows 9, programs were pulling and looking at things as if they were looking for Windows 95 or Windows 98. So the reason it was changed to Windows 10 was mostly due to those issues with it looking for older Windows operating systems when they were writing out the code for it. Um, the changes are going to be a lot more subtle moving forward and a lot less abrupt. You're going to see a gradual kind of change and easing things in as far as updates go and they push things down. You're not going to have these huge shifts like we saw between Windows 7 and Windows 8 where you have a completely foreign interface that you have to basically relearn. And for a lot of people that was really difficult and a lot of people let Microsoft know that it was really difficult. And so they've listened and they're adapting just, just as we have to adapt every day in business, Microsoft is doing the same thing. Um, and the other thing too is for an IT administrator, the good news is hopefully this will be the end of the days of having to walk over after an OS change and have to help Susie get her favorites back for her internet browser that she lost when the image changed from Windows Vista to Windows 7 or Windows 7 to Windows 8. Um, hopefully all of that stuff, uh, those days are kind of getting behind us because um, it's just going to be a continual evolution of the operating system that you see in Windows 10. Um, a little bit later on, I'm also going to show you my desktop. I'm going to explain a few things in, in practice on the slides, but I'm going to then share my screen so you can kind of see a few things to do with it um, that we're, we're going to be dealing with. The next thing is consistency, like I've talked about. Um, they're getting, Microsoft is really changing their business model slowly but surely. They're moving away from being just a software company and transitioning into being a service provider. They, uh, whether it be Office 365, um, Windows Azure, or any one of their subscription-based services, you're seeing them move in this way. And same thing is kind of what's going on with the operating system. In order to better, ha better handle the OS of the future, Microsoft is going to do all of its changes through update, like I said. Start thinking um, of your OS instead of just the operating system, more like Windows as a service, just like we have all the other things as a service, hosting as a service, software as a service. So this is Windows as a service. That's really what we're going to be moving towards. The last thing is Windows Update for Business. Um, the, there's, this is going to be a pro and enterprise feature, but it's a stronger attempt to get a, IT admins away from the, well, it's not broken and it's working just fine, so I don't need to apply updates to it. And that's kind of what they're looking to get around with Windows Update for Business because what happens is a lot of times software gets so far gone that you either have to apply 600 updates to get it up to speed again or you also a lot of times have to just start from scratch. So one of the things that Microsoft is wanting people to do is get into more of a we're going to move forward, we're going to stay consistent, we're going to do this all together. And the other thing, too, is that it's also going to give them the opportunity to just push down security updates. For those that want to keep things the way they are, they're going to do just security updates, and that will be what gets pushed down, and you're going to have control over that. Um, 
The nuts and bolts of it are going to be distribution rings, which is you can set up waves of updates kind of at your discretion on how you want to do that, when and how updates are allowed, and also when they're not allowed. So you can actually create maintenance windows, which will be nice, especially if you're a business that doesn't really get a lot of downtime. You can say, okay, well, once a month we're going to set up a maintenance window, and your Windows update for business will be in sync to that. You can set up peer-to-peer -peer delivery if you want, and then it also will integrate with Microsoft System Center as well. Now, this is the operating system nuts and bolts and details that IT admins care about. Um, so what we're looking at here is the stuff that you really care about as the person who has to deal with these individual devices day in and day out. You see here, B, BYOD versus CYOD. So what you're looking at is that in a BYOD environment, which is what everything was kind of going to before, um, you had Microsoft do stuff in Server 2012 R2 where they set up um, was I think called Workplace, which is a place where you could set up uh, a BYOD environment in your infrastructure and allow people to join their devices directly to it. Well, what IT administrators and companies are now starting to go to is more of a choose your own device where you will get a device, you'll get a, a litany of devices to choose from by your um, IT administrators and say, okay, if this is the one you want, go get this. You can go out to the store, you can buy said device with the correct version on it, or you can even do, if they have like an enterprise setup where they give you the device, if it's connected to the internet, one of the first things that pro or enterprise is going to ask you if it's connected to the internet, and that's the important part, it has to be live on an internet connection, it's going to say, is this a business or personal computer? If it's a business computer, then it'll go through and it'll ask you, okay, well, what's your, and, and this is all linked back to your domain, it's going to ask you information on what's your username and password, and then based on how your company has that set up, it will actually push out all the stuff you need for your business directly to your device just by signing into it. So, and that's a pretty cool feature that they've got coming down, but it's also something that is, uh, they've been trying to figure out the best way to kind of handle the shift in the way that people handle their actual devices anymore within an environment. The next one is particular things within the OS, and I'm gonna actually stop my presentation for a minute and make a shift so that I can show you this because it's it's pretty cool. But um, task view and virtual desktops. If you have dual monitors, it will show you all the apps that are running on the separate screens. You can create new virtual desktops in your environment of things that you're currently working on. And then the task view is going to um, will show you all of your virtual desktops that are open and the Windows control with the left or right will move between individual desktops. So I'm going to minimize this presentation for a minute. Let's see here. Okay. So I want to make sure everybody can see my screen, so I'm going to change my display real quick to let you see what I'm seeing. Um, one moment. Wait. All right, make sure that everybody can still see my screen. Um, what we're looking at here is my desktop. I've changed from an extended view where I've got two monitors to right now I just have the one. But what I want to show you here is the task view and the virtual desktops. So right now you see just what I have here, what's on my desktop, the little thing with the go to webinar. If I hit task view, it pulls up every single thing that I actually have open. So here, down here on the taskbar, you can see all that stuff. Well, you can see it all here, too. And then down here in the right-hand corner, don't worry, I'm horrible with my right and left. So if I say light, I mean right. And if I say left, I mean left. But um, you can actually create an entirely new desktop. So I'm going to do this. 
and I'm going to switch to desktop two. And you notice that all of the applications that were open on the other desktop are now gone. So I've actually created a secondary desktop that has other things open. So I'm going to pull all this stuff and make it open. And then I'm going to go here and I'm going to switch to desktop two. All the stuff went away. That, that's one of the really cool things that I like about Windows 10 is just the ability to switch between applications or if I need a completely clean workspace, I can do that quickly with a new desktop on with task view. The other thing too in task view, if you notice here every single one of these things has an X. I of course don't want to close the go to webinar stuff because then everybody goes away. So I'm just going to close Spotify because I don't need that right now and I'm going to open back up my presentation but first I need to extend my display again and set all that stuff correctly but I hope everybody was able to see that and here. All right, and we're back in business, and we're going to go back to the slideshow. Let's see here. One second, sorry about this. My apologies. Okay. Um, also, we have within there, like I said, I hope everybody was able to see that. Um, we also have, uh, you can do the Windows Control D will create new desktops as well. So that is a quick little hotkey you can use. The next thing is, um, another thing that people are in the, administrative world are going to care about is command prompt and PowerShell and the things that you can do now that you used to not be able to in PowerShell. Here's a big one, copy and paste. So control C, control V, right click, copy, right click, paste, all work in command line and PowerShell now. So you can take a command line script that you have got and paste it directly in to the command prompt with a right click paste or control V, they both work. Um, Alt-4 closes a command prompt. Um, you can also change the how transparent or opaque your command line and your PowerShell windows are. You just go under the properties of those individual things and you can set them in different colors, but you can set how transparent or opaque they are depending on what your preference is. Yes, uh, version 4 correct, yes. Um, the alt enter will give you a full screen mode and arrow snap actually works for the Windows uh, PowerShell and command prompt. So if you need to uh, have multiple windows open, the arrow snap will mark those into any given corner depending on what you want. Um, tap, text wrapping also works now as well. So all that stuff is, is working and it's stuff people have been asking for for a long time and it's actually there. So a lot of people were, the first time I talked about copy and paste and command prompt, I got, I got quite a bit of applause because that was a uh, pretty exciting thing for most people. Um, the other couple things that uh, IT administrators care about, uh, registry editor, editor, the reg editor, uh, regedit.exe has a context menu navigator. Um, it only works for HKey local machine, HKey local machine and HK current users, those are the only two that this does apply to, but if you're in one particular um, thing in registry editor that is set on the local machine, if there's a copy on the current user, you can actually switch to that other one instantaneously without having to go back and navigate to it. Um, Alt-Tab, quick app switching, which I know that a lot of you have seen or used in the past, is back. Um, and so Windows tab is as well. So you can use those. If I were to do a Windows tab, it would take me back just like you just saw there. That's Windows and tab, and it pulls up everything like the task view that we saw earlier. That's how they were able to integrate that feature back in. A lot of people missed that in Windows 8.1. Uh, it was just a quick way to switch between applications without having to go to your taskbar, find out which one was minimized, and then open it up. Uh, next we have uh, another thing is AeroSnap for multiple windows at once. On here you will see a four screens up at the same time. 
what this is, is this is the AeroSnap feature and it works across monitors. So you can actually set this on two separate monitors. If you're running dual monitors, it actually works. Um, the, you notice here I've got four screens up. I'm a soccer fan, so I was looking at a particular article on my soccer teams, uh, or football, if you will, on their website. The one thing you'll notice here is that that's, that's not the full website, but it's the reading text of that particular website. Aerosnuff was smart enough to know that, okay, this is the stuff that they really care about, and it just gave me that information that I could scroll through quickly. But as you can tell here um, on this slide, I have Outlook open, Spotify, OneNote, and my web browser. And all four of those are actually opened up on one individual screen. And especially with the introduction of 4K monitors and stuff like that, this is going to be really huge as far as being able to get a lot of stuff up there and still be able to read it. Because if you have a little 11-inch screen and you try to do this, it's not going to be really easy to look at. But on those bigger displays and higher resolution monitors, it's going to be a really handy feature. Um, you can change view to accommodate different sizes. So here I have up four. You can do two uh, side by side. You can do one large and two smaller. So you can actually completely manipulate this however you want to and give you just the desired effect or look that you want. Um, the next one is this is what the full page is going to look like for that one website I was telling you about. We have a duplicate slide here, so I apologize. But if you notice, this is what that full web page looks like with all the ads and stuff on the sides, but uh, the AeroSnap feature got it to focus just on the actual content of the actual um, web, uh, the website itself of the stuff that really actually mattered to us as the viewer. Um, the next thing is the last few things that I'm going to tell you about. These are found under the Windows settings. So if you go to the Start menu in Windows 10, which I will uh, show you in a little while, um, you can actually just type the word settings. You can pin it to your taskbar however you want to, but this is where you're going to find these three features I'm talking about here. Data Sense, Storage Sense, and Battery Saver. So Data Sense and Storage Sense have to do with like how much space your applications, your data, are actually taking up on your computer. So I don't know if, how many of you have ever used a program like TreeSize, which will tell you like how much each individual folder is taking up of space on your computer. Um, data Sense actually gives you a good idea of that, and so does Storage Sense. And the Battery Saver is a handy feature that will actually help you to know what things are actually taking up most of your battery power and really hogging all of your resources. So if you're finding that your battery on your laptop is running incredibly quick whenever you're running a certain application, you can go to Battery Saver and actually adjust those settings. And if your battery starts to get low, the Battery Saver features will kick in and start to kind of throttle back resources that are going to take a lot more of your battery life away. Um, Windows updates actually show in progress now, so it's not just a, um, this update will restart and then you have ever so often, like it actually shows you a percentage progress bar for each individual update, not just the bulk of them. Uh, and you can, what we call Microsoft math for so long actually seems to be much more real time when it comes to applying updates. Um, again, I'll show you at the end. Um, notifications, which is the area, it's going to be down by the clock on the right-hand side. It will show you all the messages from all the apps that give you alerts. Outlook is fully integrated, so a brief header of all your Outlook messages will show up in the notifications area, which is on the right-hand side. Um, it shows you information that you as the end user cares about. The old little notifications area was like stuff that you didn't really... Microsoft had a problem with an application and needs to send information to Microsoft, but it didn't really tell you anything more than that. The new stuff actually does do that. Um, the old notification tray was just never utilized well, so they've kind of listened to everybody and given you something that looks a little bit different. And when we get closer to the end of the presentation, I'll show you that as well. Then we also have the biggest thing, which I've saved towards the end part of this, which is things that the end user cares about. So this is going to be for you as the end user. You're also an administrator, and this is stuff that your uh, end users will actually get excited about. Um, that is that the start menu is back. The start menu as we knew it, 
the start menu that we all knew and loved from Windows XP and 95 or 98 or it's gone back a long way with us and then it got taken away and everybody was unhappy and then we finally got it back. So um, it looks a little bit different than what it used to, but it's still the same baseline as far as you get a place to get to your applications quickly. You have a place where you can also see some of the features you got familiar with in Windows 8.1, which are like those Metro tiles. But those Metro tiles no longer take you to an app that's outside of your desktop experience. They're integrated directly into your desktop experience. Um, you can also personalize the start menu, so if you've gotten really accustomed to the old Windows 8.1, it's funny to say old Windows 8.1, but it's true, um, the old, where it took up the full screen and you just had all those Metro tiles, if you want that, you can set it that way under personalize the start menu from the settings and personalization, and there's a start menu area where you can actually have the Windows 8.1 uh, start menu take up your full screen. So that option is there for people who want that. Um, the notifications, again, for the end user uh, will show you messages, like I said, from all apps. Outlook is fully integrated. Um, the notifications also give you an instant access to Wi-Fi, VPN, and display buttons. So if you plug in a monitor, you can go to the display buttons right there and set your displays the way that you want them to. Um, especially like if you plug in a new display and you've got it sitting on the left, but for some reason Windows thinks that the monitor is on your right side, you can go and change all that stuff very quickly from there. Um, the other thing too is, and this has been a huge one for me, I've got an example of this on the next page that will show you, um, is that Windows Explorer has changed a little bit just in the way that it actually handles and deals with things that you browse to on your direct and individual computer. Um, quick access is a huge, huge feature that I love. It's no longer just like recently used things. It's it's kind of intuitive, which is a little bit scary, but um, it remembers or knows when you've accessed something multiple times and will actually keep that file there so you can easily browse back to it quickly without having to go and click out to something else. It's just easily accessible. Um, and it, it tracks and makes changes, so if you stop using a folder, it'll move that folder out of the list, and it'll put a different one in there. So on the next screen here, I've actually got an example of that, and it's uh, right here. The quick access, you'll see up at the top here on the upper left of the file explorer, you see quick access with the lightning bolt. Um, don't know if they were a Harry Potter fan or what, but, you know, neither here or there. Um, you have things that I use all the time, desktop, documents, downloads all the different things that I've been working on recently, and from there I can just click on one of those and it'll take me directly to where that file is located so I don't have to then go into another area. Um, I know OneDrive does. I don't know about OneNote with Windows 10. I'm not 100% sure on that. I use Office 2013, so I have OneNote, um, but I know that OneDrive is definitely something that does come with it for free. Um, you can actually look online with Microsoft right now. They're running some really, and have been for a while now, some really good promos on free storage. If you, um, if you happen to use their search engine, you get credits and you can use those credits to buy things. Like the other day I had a bunch of Bing credits and I bought a $10 iTunes gift card. And I also got some 100 gigs of storage for two years for my OneDrive. So you can actually set things up that way. And on my personal computer I use for work, my entire documents, pictures, and music, um, I actually have their native locations on my OneDrive so that they automatically sync whenever I make changes. So if something ever happens to my computer, the stuff that I really, truly care about is all safe. So that's something that you can do as well as far as changing where the documents library is located. You can point it directly to OneDrive, and it will pull that stuff across. So that way you have a secondary location, you're keeping things if you ever need it. Um, let's see here. Again, here for some reason my slides sw switched back to on me. But yeah, you notice here, like my OneDrive is my, all the stuff here that has a checkbox by it are all things that I am syncing up with OneDrive. And I'm doing everything but my desktop because that just gets confusing. But I do all my documents, my music, my pictures, everything gets synced to my OneDrive. Um, then we also have the, um, when you open up what would be considered like a Metro app, like the Xbox app or something like that, um, you get these little uh, hamburger style menus is what I like to call them, these little three lines 
these are, I like to call them hamburger menus, but they're where you can get to stuff like settings and change all that stuff within these Metro apps. Like, now keep in mind too, these don't open as a separate sort of screen per se like they did in Windows 8.1. I think you all know what I'm talking about. It's just another window you can close just like any other desktop application. Um, the next one is the Xbox app. A lot of people actually care about this because they did some really cool stuff. If you haven't had a chance to go back and watch any of the Windows 10 presentations that Microsoft did when they announced, made the big announcements, um, you're going to actually want to do that because the Xbox app is going to be one of the ways that your Xbox One talks to your computer, your tablet, your phone, because one of the things that they demoed was somebody was playing Fable, the new Fable that's going to be coming out on an Xbox One, and they paused the game and they transitioned that that game to their tablet and continued to play on their tablet. And that's one of the things that that Microsoft is really, really getting behind is that idea of having your gaming center is no longer just tied to your TV, that you can go and play your game on your tablet if your kids want to watch a show and you don't want to watch a show, you want to play a game and you can do that now. So that's one of the things that's real exciting. But um, the Windows 10 environment is just going to be um, is going to be so integrated that you'll be able to just pick up a game and start playing it on your tablet that's on your Xbox. Um, and Xbox One games will be playable on Windows 10 tablets or PCs. I do not know how the Xbox 360 game announcement that Microsoft made at E3 is going to affect this because one of the things they talked about at E3 was the fact that they're working towards making all Xbox 360 games uh, reverse compatible with the Xbox One. I don't know what kind of implications that's going to have for this, but it's definitely something to keep an eye out for. Um, disabling the Xbox app on end-user devices, that will be something that will be handled. Um, you can either do it via a local group policy on the machines, or you can do it as like a global group policy. All that stuff on the pro and enterprise versions will be able to be handled via the group policy. Um, it is something you ha your computers have to be domain joined in order to really take advantage of pushing things out via group policy from a server. Uh, you can also go around and do the security settings on the individual workstations if you say have things set up in a work group or something like that. Um, the start menu, um, the bet, I wanted to talk about this a little bit more just because it's, it's kind of the best parts of Windows 8.1. Some people say that there were no good parts of Windows 8.1. I disagree. I think there were some really cool things about it. And um, it, the new start menu in Windows 10 kind of takes the best of Windows 8.1 and what was good about 7 and puts them all together. You can also change and adjust the size of your start menu and you can make it uh, transparent or completely opaque. Um, you have the apps, access to the run command, and you also have Cortana, which is the next thing that we're going to kind of talk about. Uh, you have direct integration right there in the start menu with that as well. Um, Cortana, uh, most of you guys have seen commercials for it. It's the personal digital assistant that was on the Windows phone. Uh, it is also going to be a fully integrated part of Windows 10. It can tie directly to your Microsoft account. Um, you can also set how much information you want it to have. So it doesn't by default say, hey, I'm going to assume every part of your life for you and take over your life as your personal digital assistant. You can go into the properties and tell it what you want it to handle, what you don't want it to handle. It will give you that sort of granular capability to understand it and how much you want it to take control of. But um, it will also, like I said, it integrates with your Microsoft account. So say you set an appointment on your computer to pick up flowers for your wife, that, that message and that appointment will transcend over to your Windows phone if you have uh, if you have it set up correctly. So you can actually, things will carry over one to the other. Yes, it is a play on the Halo uh, character that was in the Halo games. Cortana is that is exactly where they got the name from, and that is that was done very intentionally because they know that the Halo games are super popular, so they wanted to do something that felt a lot more personal than giving it a name that 
is close to, or is, is that what Tom Cruise named his kid? I can't remember. But the, um, the yeah, Cortana is a direct play on Halo. The next thing is what was called Project Spartan or uh, is now called Microsoft Edge. That is the new web browser that Microsoft is going to be using going forward. Um, Internet Explorer as we know it is gone. So I think that this is Microsoft's attempt to have a much better web browser that's going to kind of accommodate the way people use the Internet now because it's changed a lot. Um, it has a reading feature built into it where you can actually save a website out and um, read it at a later time without having to be online. It will create a library of pages that you want to go back and look at. It's especially nice, too, if you start reading an article and you realize, I've got at least another 10 minutes to read the rest of this article. You can save it and read it later. Um, you can read sites without distractions or ad videos. You can actually move all that stuff out of the way and uh, give it in the reading mode where all that stuff is gone. You just have the internet article that you want to read at the front and ready for you. Um, you can also annotate web pages. So say you're in a presentation, you need to pull up a web page and you need people to pay particular attention to something. You can actually go in and annotate those individual web pages. Uh. The biggest difference between IE11 and Edge is going to be one is the Cortana integration. The other is going to be the annotation of web pages and then also the ability to completely get rid of the ads and automatic play videos and stuff like that. Um, those, are, those are kind of the things that I'm seeing being touted as the big features that change from IE11. I think, too, another thing is um, they're trying to really bridge that gap also on issues of compatibility that as newer web pages came out, old web pages wouldn't look right. They're kind of trying to do what they can to take care of that problem as well, which so many end users moved away from Internet Explorer because of that and shifted to something like Chrome or Firefox. I do not know the answer to that. I don't know what the back engine looks like. From everything that Microsoft has said, though, this is a completely new browser from the, from the ground up. So they're not even really using any of the IE parts that I know of, but like I said, I'm not 100% sure on that part of it. As far as Edge being available on Android, I do not know. Uh, I've not heard anything about that. I've not heard of anybody getting this browser other than people that are going to be running Windows 10 Mobile. That very well may change, but I do not know of anything right offhand. One of the things that Microsoft is really trying to do is they're trying to continue to push that footprint into the mobile market and start taking away those shares and the, the influence that Android and iPhone have and really trying to push more and more people towards the, the Windows mobile client. Will it have admin files for GPO creation for a server 2008 domain? That is a great question, and I don't know the answer right now. Um, I honestly am not 100. I can't. I can't say for sure. I don't know the answer to that. But uh, we'll save the question. And if you would do me a huge favor and be on the lookout for an email, I'll see what I can find out for you. Um, as from what I'm understanding is once. What we're seeing now in the preview builds is you have IE and you have Microsoft Edge. I have a feeling there's a good possibility that Microsoft Edge may be your only browser in Windows 10. I don't know for sure. They've not announced it one way or the other yet, but that's kind of the way things look to be leaning. Next thing, um, I know most of you are familiar with the old control panel. It's still a part of Windows 10, but everything is kind of shifting. There's no more charms bar like there was in Windows uh, 8.1 where you had to hit Windows C and then you could get to PC settings and all that stuff. If you just go to the start menu and type settings or you can pin it to your taskbar, it will take you to a page that looks like this. And this is where you do a lot of your basic stuff as far as systems, printers, all that stuff is handled through here. Um, I don't... Like I said, I, the control panel is still there, but one of the things that you're seeing as a, a behavior 
of Microsoft is as they introduce a new way to do something, a lot of times the old way of doing something eventually gets phased out. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I think eventually you're going to see most of the things to control the computer are going to be happening here, but you do still have access to the control panel. So um, in Windows 8.1, if you right-clicked on the gray window, you could get the control panel, run command, command prompt as admin, all that stuff. You can still do that. And I'll show you here in a moment because we're getting close to being done. But um, the other thing, too, is that I've got a couple of links here. And I'm going to switch to my next slide. And I'm going to bring this back up before we close. But for And this is where I got a lot of my information. Your Windows, uh, the blogs for Windows.com uh, down here at the bottom for Windows 10 is huge. And that is where most of the communication that Windows has on anything to do with what's coming in the different editions, what are the new features, because as new builds come out, they do have new features or they'll tell you something they fixed or changed, and I've already gone through at least seven different preview builds um, of Microsoft's Windows 10, and each one has been a little bit different, and these places are where I go to find a lot of the information that I'm looking for is, okay, well, it's a new version, what's changed? Um, we also are going to have another uh, presentation coming up in roughly right around a month. That is with my good friend and peer, Mr. Daryl Hunter. On July 29th, we're going to be doing a Skype for Business webinar. Daryl is our, our main Skype for Business, which used to be called Link uh, Architect. He is one of the smartest people that you're ever going to meet and he gives a good presentation as well. So I highly encourage you to keep an eye out for that invite. We'd love to have you, and it's going to be a good presentation. He just did one of our local Microsoft user group presentations on Link, and it was a huge, huge success. So before we end end, I want to take you back to my desktop real quick. I've got a question here. It says, I'm in education. What are your thoughts on how this is going to change things? trying to wrap my head around it all. Right now we have 7 Pro, but I doubt we have Assurance. We are a small school with a lot of old equipment. That is um, that is a great question. If you want to, uh, we can actually look into that for you. We can look at what you have and look at how the education portion of all the licensing works as of right now. Uh, the education side is a little murky for me too, just because I've not dealt with a lot of it. I know a lot about the enterprise side and volume licensing with software assurance for um, for nonprofits that aren't education, but I know education is a completely different animal. So we'll find out though for you for sure. Um, real quick before I go to the Q and A side, I am going to change my displays to let you see a couple of things real quick before you all go away. Um, You know, all right, so now we're out of the presentation. We are, you are seeing my screen. So down here, this is the new start menu that I was talking about. So you go here, and this is what it looks like. The one thing you notice is I can change the size of this. I can make it as big as I want or as small as I want, and it can actually go this way too. And you notice that the old Windows 8.1 pictures and mobile metro tiles are integrated in. So they're here alongside all of my apps. So like you, all your programs and stuff, they're listed here in alphabetical order and it has ones that I've recently used or viewed or up here at the top. But it does everything in alphabetical order, but say I needed to go to settings. It pulls up just by typing settings, it automatically looks and shows first all the things directly connected to my device. You notice this says settings, this says web. So it's giving me both internal settings and web settings as well. So you get both. One of the things I liked about Windows 8.1, right click on the gray window, you get all this stuff here, your control panel, task manager, all that stuff. But you notice too that when I hit Windows C, I don't get that thing that comes up on the side anymore where I go to shut down. That's all built back in here. So, oops, hold on. Lock myself out. So you can shut down right here, but there's also power options right there in your display as well. 
So here we are, back to the presentation. I just realized I hamstrung myself. Right on. One second. Go back to um, what will be the system requirements for Windows 10? Um, anything that's running Windows 7 right now will run Windows 10 without a problem. And what I've found that both Windows 8 and Windows 10 are much less resource intensive than even Windows 7 was. So anything that you have that is gracefully and pretty successfully running Windows 7 architecture is going to run Windows 10 or Windows 8.1 without a problem. Um, I actually have found that I can run systems with less RAM on Windows 8 and Windows 10 than what I was running for Windows 7 machine. Windows 7 was very, very resource intensive and really, really pushed the limits of what I could do with my machine, but I had to have a lot there to do it. Um, in place upgrades is working for the preview build. If you are running a preview build, um, if you go to settings and you go to update and recovery, you'll notice that all your updates will show up there. But underneath there, under advanced settings, you'll see a set where it says it'll bring up another list of things and it'll say how quickly do you want to receive preview builds? And you have the option for slow or fast. If you go with fast, any time that there is a new preview build available, it will push out via Windows Update and it will show up there for you to install it. If you go slow, then it's going to do when they have the most stable build out that they feel confident with, that's what they're pushing to everybody that's doing the accommodation via the slow build. So you get to that under the go to PC or go to settings, go to update and recovery and go to the advanced section and that's where you'll find to know which one you're dealing with as far as whether it's just slow or fast and um, if for some reason you're not getting updates there's some tricks that you can do to actually get your Windows updates to kind of start and refresh which I've had to do a couple of times in order to make sure that I'm pulling down the right ones. Okay, um, other than that we're going to leave some time now for, for questions. Uh, any questions you guys have that you haven't asked that yet that you want an answer to, I'm going to stick around for probably at least the next 15 to 20 minutes to, to answer any of them that I can. Uh, guys, thank you so much for being here. I'm really, really thankful that so many of you all were able to make it. Uh, thanks for answering our poll questions, and we'll be getting out the slide deck and all this stuff to you as well. Um, like I said, you can follow me on Twitter at AndyCook502. Um, you can also get in touch with me at andy.cook at mirazon.com. I realized I did not put my email address on there, and that was a uh, party foul on my part. So again, my email address is andy.cook at mirazon.com. Thanks again for being here, guys. It's been a lot of fun to just get to talk to you about something I'm pretty excited about.